All right, so welcome. Uh, my name is Alex Alanise. I'm with On Point TC. Um, I like to share information with you guys um, every week, and uh, we'll be recording. Today's February 23rd, uh, 2022, uh, roughly about six o'clock. It's a Wednesday. Um, gets dark out early, so uh, do excuse the shadow to my to my right. Um, Today we'll be talking mainly about expired listings and how they can benefit you and your business. Uh, this is more is less uh, technical and more tactical in terms of uh, showing you some how to on how to get some business. Um, expired listings has always been a target for real estate agents, mainly because some people believe that it was the agent's fault why the reason you know the reason why a property didn't sell. And, and hence it expires. And then other folks come in and try to pick up that, that uh, fallen business. And sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not. But I will be going over uh, some of the reasons why um, listings expire. Whereas um, if you have a listing um, to look out for these pitfalls and, and try and uh, and find solutions to some of the things that we'll be talking about today. So uh, thank you guys for logging in early. Let me uh, let me go to get started. So uh, there's my information. Um, feel free to call me anytime or email me. Um, I meet you guys on my side, but if you happen to chime in, as I always mention, I do like a dialogue versus a monologue. And so if you guys uh, wish to chime in at any time, feel free to ask a question or you can ask a question on the chat room. I'll try to get to each of your questions at the end of each slide, okay? Um, so I, that I just said. Um, thank you guys for logging in early so we can get an early start and get off on time. And as as always, if you know anybody that can benefit from these uh presentations, feel free to share the link to the YouTube channel um, and or you can invite them to the show here on Wednesdays at six o'clock anytime. Okay, so thank you guys for coming on. Any questions or comments before we get started? All right, well, let's get started. Um, this one started off with a funny, did your realtor leave a bad taste in your mouth? Um, listings expire frequently on MLS for different reasons. This breakdown reflects how agents can better gauge and market listings that were once on the market. Don't allow other agents to get your expired listings, meaning that, that don't fall on the other side of the fence of an expired listing. So, so this uh, presentation is actually uh, cut into two different parts. The first part is um, some of the reasons why listings expire. And then that, that with that knowledge, you can help yourself uh, maybe not have a listing expire for yourself, but then also uh, the how-to on how to find those listings and market them, okay? So that's what we'll be talking about today. Any questions or comments on that? So here's a, a quick overview. Um, reasons for expiration, right? So overexposure, condition and appeal, over-optimistic sellers, over-optimistic agents, over encumbered property, dysfunctional lamp design, poor location and occupancy. These are all uh, viable reasons why a listing, listings do expire um, frequently. And so we'll be going over that today, okay? So um, research, advertising and marketing will be the second part. So find expired listings in the target area, researching expired listings to find out um, why it didn't sell, market conclusions to the homeowner by direct mail or door knocking, any, any means necessary, and practice regular advertise, advertisements to include comments about expired listings, right? So this is the, the breakdown of what we'll be talking about today, as mentioned before. Any questions or comments before we get started? All right, so definition and examples of overexposure, which is the first part, okay? So quick definition, the state of taking on too much risk. One, one may be overexposed to an, an industry, a company, or even an investment vehicle. 
For example, home price may be overexposed to the predominance of in a market segment by pricing it above the most probable selling price relative to typical market reactions. Now, some of those are appraisal terms that I that I've used frequently, but just know that when you overexpose something, it means that you have a market that is pretty general. And let's just say that the that the average home is selling for six hundred thousand, but you overexpose a property by by marketing it now for seven hundred thousand. So if you have the majority of homes that are selling for six hundred thousand that are very similar to your home, you've overexposed it right to the market at seven hundred thousand. Sellers have upper bracket tendencies, so typically active listings are overexposed, conducive to an increasing market, which is kind of what we experienced here uh, the, these past couple months, right? Is as soon as people know that there are it, are an abundance of buyers, so there's high demand, right? Because sellers have an upper bracket tendency, meaning that they they have a tendency to go above what the what the uh, what the norm is or the average in a market area, right? Um, they typically will overexpose the property. Sellers also have optimistic views of appeal and condition of their homes. Buyers will typically have a pessimistic view of the same items, thus causing a difference of opinion in price. To the buyer, it's overexposed. To the seller, it's priced right. And I'm sure you guys have heard that before. Uh, pretty much in anything that you sell, doesn't doesn't even have to be a house. It could be anything. It could be a bike, right? Um, it could be a, a microwave, right? Doesn't really matter. These are, these are the typical views of both sides. So overexposure versus exposure time. So, so overexposing a property price can work to the benefit of your client's needs. Depending on your client's urgency to sell, exposure is relative to the time it is exposed to the open market. At times, exposing a property for longer periods of time can increase its chances to sell for more. But this is usually the exception. So understand that there is a balance now between, uh, and, and, and let's use the word overpriced. It would be synonymous to overexposure, okay? Versus the exposure time. So if you were, if you were to take a piece of property and market it for six months, okay, that's the exposure time. Now, if, if you were to overprice that same property, it may take some more time on the market in order to sell it for the price that you're that you're that you're looking at in terms of it being overpriced. So, so there's a balance between the two. So th there is a little nugget that I can share with you at this point, and that is there, there's really only one thing that sells anything. It doesn't matter what it is, it's price. So if you overprice something. Expect it to be ex expect the exposure time to be longer. Obviously, if you underprice something, so let's go the other the other direction. If you underprice something, the exposure time is going to be very short. So so understand that when you are uh, researching a piece of property, these are the 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 the, the factors that are. Uh, these are the factors that you're up against, okay? You have to balance the exposure of the property and its exposure time. And remember, we, the, the word exposure in this case is synonymous with price. So we would say we're, we're gonna price it in terms of the time that we want it exposed to the market. So if we, if, if we, if we market a house for a hundred bucks, Believe me, you're going to have 150 offers in the next couple of minutes. Whereas if you were to market a property for 650,000 in a 625,000 predominant area, you'll probably get it sold probably in three or four weeks. So that's the difference. So once you can recognize the balance that you're doing now in your, in your research on a property, right? You can then uh, gauge uh, the exposure time. And, and, and the amount of work that's involved in that. Any questions or comments on that slide? So the next item 
and 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 actually let, let's go back in terms of overexposure okay um remember that these are reasons why listings expire so the first reason is overexposure or overpriced right the next reason could be depreciated condition so now some some would look at these uh items that you're looking at here as favorable because now they they're thinking hey i'm going to get a good deal on this property so let's get through the slide real quick depreciation in this example refers to the, the deterioration of the physical aspects of a property depreciation in general is loss of value for any reason so if you guys can remember that depreciation is is loss of value for any reason in this case it is physical deterioration and poor appearance not to mention sometimes poor health and safety because what, what we're seeing on the top picture there's mold okay well we can assume it's mold but for the most part it probably is mold there's moisture um, on the walls there and it's creating mold health and safety issues so again we're, we're potentially losing value for a couple of reasons number one the physical aspects of it are not nice to look at right the other part of it is is that it's potentially health and safety so th this is all loss of value. So could this be a reason why our, our listing expired? Because potentially, again, we probably had it overexposed. Physical depreciation, sometimes called deferred maintenance, also affects the appeal of the home. And that's kind of what we're looking at on the bottom picture there, where you have some exposed wood, you have chipping paint, you don't have any landscape. Um, it's just, it's, it's depreciated in condition. Again, depreciation, loss of value for any reason. Its effect on value usually is calculated by its cost to cure plus profit. I remember we talked about this before, is that every single thing on the face of the planet that is not uh, growing out of the ground uh, that you see that has been built, made, serviced, uh, created, um, so on and so forth, et cetera, et cetera, okay, has profit built in. So if if I'm gonna go in, let's say to this property here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna um, say make an offer on this property, more than likely it's gonna be a low offer because it's gonna be what it costs me to fix it, so cost to cure, right? Plus what I'm gonna make in profit, because I, I certainly don't expect to spend fifty thousand uh, dollars on this property once i buy it only to once sell it get fifty thousand dollars back no most investors are going to say no i'm going to spend fifty thousand dollars on this on this house but i want one hundred twenty five thousand dollars back when i sell it. now i'm just using x numbers but i think the idea is is that for the most part i expect to have profit built in so this is this could be a reason why a a property <clears throat> uh, expires because at some point the the seller wasn't ready to let it go for any less because they weren't ready to deal with the fact that there's there's the cost to cure plus profit. Now, could a seller potentially profit from doing the work themselves and then selling the property? Absolutely. But some people just don't have the means or the desire to do that. It would cause a listing to expire if they overexpose the property. And, and again, the word is synonymous with overpriced. So any questions or comments on that slide? Oh, there's the last one. How can this cause a listing to expire? Well, I just mentioned that. So um, any questions or comments on that slide on depreciated condition? All right, well, let's, move, let's keep moving. So appeal, I think that most of us are familiar with, with the word curb appeal. The power or ability to attract, interest, amuse, or stimulate the mind or emotions, right? So, hey, if we all see a house that is really super nice, uh, you know, it puts a smile on our face. You know, it affects our emotions. It's like, oh, wow, you know, that's really nice. I like that, right? Sometimes it's lit up really nice, has really nice landscape, right? Uh, you even like the colors that they used, um, the architecture behind it, all of this causes an emotional reaction, 
right? Well, guess what? That ups the price. So appeal, right, has everything to do with how we gauge what we're going to price a property for and or what the seller is going to price it for, right? But now let's look at the negative aspects of this. Here you have a picture of a house. It looks like it's depreciated condition, but certainly uh, has fallen, uh, fallen victim to its landscape because there's definitely no appeal there. I mean, unless you're going to do donuts in the front yard, right, with your car. So that's not uh, typically what, what we would do. So simply put, does a property make you feel good or bad about it? And that's its appeal, right? A seller may not have put an effort to improve the attractiveness of his or her property. Seller's reliance and false expectation of the real estate industry to sell a property with such unappealing characteristics. So you, here you have um, a seller that thinks that a, that a listing agent has some magical powder that, or, that they're going to sprinkle all over the property. And then a, a property that looks like this, um, that's not very appealing. The seller seems to think that, hey, you know, I'm going to hire the top agent in the market. And all of a sudden that agent magically is going to sell it for all kinds of, of money that that possibly the seller is really not even really entitled to. Um, I have yet to see it. Uh, I've been 33 years here in the industry and I've never seen an uh, agent with magical dust that they can throw on the properties to make them look all great. Now, have I seen investors come in and, and change the appeal of the property and, and do what they need to do to get top dollar for the property? Yeah, now what they've done is they've changed the appeal. So it has little to do with what the agent is doing. It has more to do with what they did with the property. They beautified it. They increased it, its appeal, right? Are some of the characteristics, characteristics curable? We should recommend such cures. And this is what, what we do as, as listing agents. We go in and we're going to tell um, our clients, hey, you know what? Best thing to do, I recommend you you trim the trees back. And now with, with the new home hardening and defensible space guidelines that we have in some areas, this is actually gonna be a requirement now from the fire department. Some of us have experienced that, okay? But I recommend to this seller, hey, you know what? A nice, a, a, a nice coat of paint and, you know, uh, manicuring the front yard is going to is going to really change the appeal of this property. So um, right now we have loss of value because we have overgrown grass and some and some shrubs and foliage, right? It's overgrown. But if they if they cut it down, they take a little bit of time. The amount of time that they spent, and let's just say you know that they hire a gardener. Let's say it's going to cost them five hundred dollars to 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 cure this situation, right? They could potentially make a couple thousand, if not five or ten thousand dollars more on the price of the home just because of that. Was it worth the five hundred bucks? And I would say, yeah. So this could be one of the reasons why a listing expires. So uh, why would a home listing expire with with poor appeal? And, and I answered some of those questions already. Unless unless any of you have any other uh, suggestions, why? Um, or, or how appeal affects a property um, in terms of it ultimately expiring. So any questions or comments on that slide? So, so far we have overexposure and uh, appeal. And what was the last one? So here, here we have over-optimistic sellers. So I would say that that's probably all sellers that I I've, I've I've, haven't met very, very many uh, sellers that say, oh, you know, I'm not going to get much for my property. Just put it off for whatever you like. No way. They are pretty much uh, very inquisitive about what's going on in the market. They want to see information on how much they can get for their property. They want to know that you're going to be pushing for the highest possible dollar that they can get. Um, and so, yeah, you know, you put your best foot forward in terms of your research on the property. But you're still gonna have your over optimistic sellers. So optimism, right? 
hopefulness and confidence about the future and successful outcome of something. And so, yeah, they're hopeful that, you know, they can sell their, their property for $50,000, $100,000 more than everything else in the area, right? It's not, real, not usually real, realistic, but uh, sometimes we do see some, some anomalies in an area where uh, a particular buyer is willing to pay a little bit more for whatever reason. It could be a characteristic of the property, but it doesn't change the optimism of the seller. And ultimately uh, causes sometimes that listing to expire because they're not willing to drop the price. So simply put, an optimistic seller prices a home for much more than a buyer would pay. A, seller, a seller's view of condition, appeal, any necessary repairs, comparable sales, and location of the property are unrealistic, right? Because they're, they're, they're again, possibly putting most of their, their hopefulness in the fact that a listing agent will come in and do something magical with the property for it to sell for more. When in reality, you know, the, the seller hasn't taken the time to maybe fix some deferred maintenance. You know, we talked about appeal um, in terms of maybe mowing the lawn, right? Doing some necessary repairs or even taking a look at the comparables in the area, right? And then I have, you know, I've had some, some sellers uh, argue, you know, even though their property is right next door to, to a freeway where you literally walk outside and all you hear is cars driving by really fast and trucks, that it really doesn't have an effect on, on the value of the home. And what they don't realize is that it's, it's in a fixed location. So absolutely, it does have an effect on a, a buyer. Would a buyer be, be willing to pay the same amount of money for a property that's located, let's say near, near a park or, or a freeway or even a major street or on a major street versus an interior location that doesn't have those influences. And I would say, no, a, buy, a buyer would pay more for a property that had uh, that did not have those, those influences. So in terms of over, being over optimistic, sellers reliance and false expectation of the real estate industry to sell an overpriced home. And that's that magical dust theory that uh, I keep talking about. And uh, uh, I just find it funny how, you know, some uh, people, and I've, I've talked to many of them actually, will, will not hire me because they think, oh, well, the, you know, the guy that uh, I saw his sign, you know, a hundred times already, he must be a better agent because they've seen his sign a few times. When in reality, um, if I list the property or if the other person lists the property, it could potentially be sold to the same buyer and for the same price. So did the agent have anything to do with it? Probably not. But uh, people still believe that that magical dust theory exists. And so uh, maybe you can kind of sell them on that, right? Uh, if you know that your seller is an over-optimistic individual, right? Uh, you can kind of play on that. So why would a home listing expire with an over-optimistic seller? Anybody? And it's mainly because, you know, they it goes back to that, that uh, unrealistic view of the condition, the comparables in the area, the location, uh, any repairs that are needed. They have an unrealistic view of that, right? So they're over-optimistic. So any questions or comments on that slide? So here we have over-optimistic agents. And this is, this is actually uh, uh, fairly common, right? Uh, hopefulness and confidence about the future and successful outcome of something. So there's optimism and right? simply a definition of optimism. Um, similar to sellers, an, op over, an optimistic agent suggests a price for a home for much more than a buyer would pay so as to retain the listing. Agents use this tactic to overextend their competition. And it's mainly because if they have uh, four, five, six other agents potentially marketing the same area, and um, the only way really to gain the, the business of these sellers is the agents will say, oh, I can sell your house for way more than that. Even though it's not, it's, it's not a true statement, because again, they don't have some magical dust that they can 
sprinkle on the property where every person that comes in says, oh yeah, I'll pay $100,000 more for this property, right? Or let's just say $50,000 or even $20,000 more for this property, mainly because the majority of the homes in the area are selling for much less. Remember that the value of something is only compared to, or is only worth what it could be compared to. And here's some, something else to think about. The value of something is only worth what you can buy it for. So let me let me use the example of a flashlight. If I can buy a flashlight for twenty dollars, why would I buy it for fifty? Well, the the answer is I would not. I wouldn't buy it for fifty. I would I would go and buy it for twenty bucks because that's the going rate of a flashlight. Same thing applies to homes, right? Now it's a little bit more convoluted with homes because homes have different sizes, room counts, utility amenities you know there's there's a lot of different things going on but um, usually those same categories they fall into different segments in a market so obviously if you're looking at a two-story home versus a one-story home obviously they're going to sell for different but you're, that means that you're going to compare to those same things so the over optimistic agent comes in and potentially even compares to those other things kind of making it seem like they can sell it for more. An agent may suggest that condition, appeal, any necessary repairs, comparable sales and location of a property are underemphasized, meaning that doesn't really want to point out the negatives of the property because, well, you want you want the listing. You want to you want to get the listing signed. So you're you're kind of willing to step back a little bit. But isn't it worse that you go and do this and you're unable to sell it and the listing expires, I would say it is because you end up losing the client and all of their referrals. Agents reliance and overconfidence of being able to sell a property for more than its actual value. This usually coupled with not looking at a market area sales correctly. I call this the magic dust syndrome, right? And I still got people uh, logging in here. Give me a second. So agents reliance on overconfidence of being able to sell a property for more than its actual value. This usually coupled with not looking at a market area sales correctly. And it's mainly because what they do is when they, when they use the word comparable sales, the sales that they're looking at are not truly comparable. They're just looking at sales. Oh, well, look at, they're looking at the numbers versus the the similarities you know i i've actually seen agents try to compare homes that are, are almost over a thousand square feet bigger to justify their value when there's homes that are like within 50 square feet 100 square feet difference in the area right and and they're they're trying to comp compare to a home that's almost a thousand square feet bigger that's over optimism you're not really looking at the market for what it is. You're simply just trying to target, you're trying to target a, a price. And, and I would call that malpractice, but for the most part, it's an activity that causes listings to expire. So why would a home listing expire with an over-optimistic agent? And I, I actually just mentioned that, but uh, do you guys have any questions or comments on that slide? You know, it, some of this, and I do apologize, it's kind of like looking in the mirror because, because we all do this. I can't say that I didn't do it when I first started because I didn't know any better, right? But, but as I started to see what was happening, I started to realize, oh man, you know what? I'm kind of falling into the mold of what, what other people have gone through and just probably ended up quitting the industry. So I, I put a mirror up for the purposes of you taking advantage of the fact that there this activity is going on and you guys can take advantage of it and you'll see why in the second segment so any questions or comments on that so over encumbered property so we we all know about this right restricted or, or burdened in such a way that free action or movement is difficult in terms of the definition of encumbered typically a property that is over encumbered has taken on too much debt. This usually occurs when the market 
um, decreases over a period of time, causing the collateral to be worth less than its liens. So obviously a, a home seller wants to try and sell the property for what they owe at minimum, right? So a property owner has many options. The required disclosure by agents is found on a short sale addendum, right? And what that means is, is that uh, when we approach a seller on a property that's over encumbered, we're required to say these things. And it's on, it's on an addendum, it's on the short sale addendum. And um, uh, these, are, these are the options that we can, can legally give a seller in terms of what we can do or what can, what they can do, right? They can apply for a loan modification with their lender. They can file bankruptcy. They can go into foreclosure or they can do a deed in lieu. Now you'll notice that none of those options says short sale. And that's because short sale is not a legal term. The legal term is forgiveness of debt, okay? And forgiveness of debt is a request. It's not an option. And, and the, the lender doesn't have to comply. So this is why uh, in terms of our legal responsibilities to a seller that is over encumbered, right? Doesn't include short sale. But we all know that when we are taking a listing that that's exactly what the seller has in mind. They want to try and ne negotiate their way out of an over encumbered piece of property. Pretty interesting stuff, huh guys? Short sale is an invented term by the real estate industry, otherwise known as forgiveness of debt, which, which I just mentioned. Sellers usually overextend price, time, and condition on such property in order to buy time, which sometimes works as a disadvantage. Okay. And I'll kind of expand on that just a little bit. Some of the short sales that I've dealt with in the past, the, the sellers sometimes take their sweet time getting information, doing all, the, all this the stuff they're supposed to be doing. And it's mainly because they're living there for free. So some of them last 18 months, you know, 24 months. You can have a listing for that long and, you know, potentially even have it under contract. But the, the buyers, I'm sorry, the sellers of the property are living there for free. Why wouldn't they just want to keep living there? So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's, part of the reason why uh, some of the short sales don't get approved. And that's because the banks know what, what, the, what the homeowner is doing and it can work to their disadvantage if they stall on trying, if they try, try to renegotiate. Remember the legal options, not one of them was a short sale. They had these other options that they could do, right? But, but short sale wasn't one of them. The, the lender could just say no. And it's happened to me a few times. I can, I can honestly say that I lost a lot of sleep over the ones that I lost because it wasn't fair, but the, the homeowners caused it. So, so it, it was a disadvantage to them. So that became an expired listing. So that kind of answers the last one, right? Right when a home expired, if it's over encumbered, that could be one of the reasons. So any questions or comments on that? All right, well, let's keep moving. We're on uh, slide 11 and we're at 639, so we're doing pretty good. So this is something that we don't always look at, uh, the majority of us, because we're, we're kind of looking more at condition a lot of times um, of a property. The layout design is something that it, it gets a little bit more technical. So, so let's go through the slide and then I'll, I'll do some explanation. In, archi in architecture engineering, process layout is a design for the floor plan of a home which aims to improve efficiency. I'm sorry, I got somebody here logging in. Um, let me start over. In architecture engineering, process layout is a design for a floor plan of a home which aims to improve efficiency by arranging utility and facilities according to its function. So, one of, one of the words that I like to use is ease of function. And, and that, that kind of brings light to why an architect would, would uh, do what he does 
with a design that he puts together, it, because it really has to do with ease of function or ease of use would be another way of saying it, right? A poorly laid out home will affect its value and appeal to a buyer. And that's true. Any of us, sometimes we probably won't even recognize that we're doing this, but any of us that walk into a bad layout automatically are affected by it emotionally. It's kind of like what I was talking about earlier about the appeal, right? Uh, its appeal to you just dropped a few numbers Right. And remember, we talked about depreciation being loss of value for any reason. Well, this could be a reason you could have a loss of value. Right. So now you have you have an individual that's living at this property. Right. And they don't seem to see a problem with it because they got used to it. But what does it cause if you're comparing this layout to a layout that's, that's that better functions? Obviously, the one that has better function is going to be worth more. This is usually an incredible, I'm sorry, an incurable condition, which will affect seller's perspective of price. Sellers usually become accustomed to these types of deficiencies and tend to turn a blind eye, which, which uh, is what I, I mentioned earlier. One must reference the deficiency to the client and get an agreement on a reduction of price in the area. So you kind of have to gauge, hey, you know what? This is the going on in the entire area and it's selling for a little bit more. Obviously a typical buyer is going to come in and they're going to be affected by this because they've never seen it before. A seller has become a little bit more accustomed to it. So they're not willing to see that. They're going to put the blinders on. So why would a home listing expire with a poor layout design? It's because it kind of overflows now to an over-optimistic seller, right? He's turning a blind eye to, to the layout of the property. And there's an example of it there um, in the picture that I used, okay? You have a living room that is kind of cut off and it could be maybe because the lot is the way it is, but it's cut off, okay? But you'll notice that there's, in order to get to the bathroom, um, the one, the one on the bottom, you have to go through the kitchen. So that's not exactly a good layout, but check it out. If you're in the living room, okay, if you want to get to the other bathroom, you have to go through the main bedroom. And that's true about the other two bedrooms. The other two bedrooms, if you want to get to the bathroom, either one, you either have to go through the main bedroom or you have to go through the kitchen. Not a good layout at all. Let's forget about the angle living room um, because most uh, furniture doesn't fit well in angles. And so you end up losing a little bit of space because of it. So these are, again, loss of value for any reason, depreciation, right? These are a form of depreciation, functional layout design, and it's, it's functional use is uh, the, the words I like to use with that. Any, any uh, questions or comments on that slide? Yes, yeah, so obviously location. I mean, uh, we've all heard location, location, location um, in real estate, and it's true. You know, uh, uh, the location of a a piece of land, its value will will be distinguished greatly by where it's located. So, if you have a piece of land, an acre of land in Lucerne Valley that you can probably buy right now for a couple thousand dollars. And I'm talking about an acre of land because there's nothing out there. Uh, it's just raw land. There's not even any sewage around, okay? And that same acre of land, let's say in Malibu, is probably a couple million dollars. Uh, still raw land, not even the sewers or streets or anything, but the, the difference is its location. So a particular place or position, uh, it's synonyms or position, place, situation, site, locality, locale, spot, point, or whereabouts. And so no need for that. Uh, the location of a home is not just its immediate surroundings. The city, county, and even state, a home is located in affects its value. Right? So if, if I were to say that the house is in Compton, 
versus the house is in Beverly Hills, your mind obviously goes to those uh, polarities, right? It goes to those ends because, uh, or, or actually an area that I really don't like, Hawaiian Gardens, right? I hope nobody lives in Hawaiian Gardens, but at the end of the day, it's a pretty rough area. And I, I, would, I would probably rather be in Compton, right? So location, location, location. The position that a home is placed can also affect its marketability or its desire to a buyer. And hence the reason why I use this picture of this house up on the, uh, up on the pillars, because it's been placed on pillars. And I, I do believe unless there's some, some uh, special use for this particular little house, um, its value just went down. So a home can be placed nearby or adjacent to a negative exterior influence, otherwise known as external depreciation. And again, there's that word again, depreciation, right? Loss of value for any reason. So if we have uh, a piece of property that happens to be on a busy street, or let's say it sides commercial or industrial, or it sides a freeway or is close to an airport where you have overflights, right? Um, and I apologize. Um, I didn't see the questions that came through. Um, okay, yeah. So, so he mentioned the land around the Sultan Sea. I remember some years back, and I'll just kind of uh, uh, break off on a sidebar here real quick. Uh, when I first started in real estate, they were selling the land out, out by the Sultan Sea uh, in payments. So you could put a couple hundred dollars down. Uh, the, the land was like six grand. And, you know, you pay like uh, 75 bucks a month for so many years and the, and the land is yours. But what you don't realize is, is that over the years when you're paying, and let's just say you go through a couple of years of making those payments, you start to realize that the land that you just bought isn't appreciating in value. As a matter of fact, some of it even depreciates in value. You know, you kind of do, you kind of do your homework and you find out, oh man, I've been paying on this thing for a couple of years already. And I bought it for six grand, but I can buy one now, you know, a couple couple lots down for five thousand. So, so it's worth less. So what happens? Most people stop making the payments. So what happens? The original owner did, ha did actually, in which most people don't even realize, they put you in the land contract, and they end up foreclosing on you, and then they just sell it to the next person and do the same thing. And those people have been doing that for 30, 40, 50 years, and they still own the properties, but they're getting paid on it, and they don't have to do anything. It's, it's, it's pretty much a scam, but for the most part, it kind of goes along with the location that Robert and Celia are mentioning here in Salton Sea, right? So uh, Celia, property located in a busy street, how much less value do you think would be? Well, um, let's, let's, Put that in a different perspective. Okay, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, one could argue. Okay, you you would you if you have a client, a buyer, that is looking in an area, and let's say that there's five houses in the area. Okay, uh, one of them happens to be located on a busy street, and let's say it's it's a four lane highway. Uh, Let's say the speed limit is 45, so it's not too crazy. I mean, we can get a little crazier, say the speed limit is 50, which, which makes it a little bit uh, more or less attractive, right? But let's just say it's 45, four, it's four lanes versus similar homes that are in an interior location that are now uh, in a, a two lane uh, street, no, no lines on the street, and the speed limit's 20 miles an hour, which is interior location speed limit, right? Um, the buyer would then, would then gauge the difference. So I can't give you a, a, an equation or a calculation as to how much less a house would sell because there's too many other factors. Depends on the area, depends on the house, depends on what, what it's being compared to. But I would say that if, that it said, yeah, if you were buying the house, you could gauge how much less you would pay for that. For, for the exterior influence, 
or the external depreciation that you find from a busy street. And mainly because you may like the house a little bit more than you like the ones on the interior location. Now, I've seen homes sell for $100,000 more because they have a view. That's kind of the same situation. But that doesn't apply to all views because I've seen homes sell for $10,000 more with the view, right? Because maybe they're partial views or they're treetop views or um, they're extended views. So it really depends. There, there's, there's, there's a lot going on there. But what I want you to recognize, okay, is that's, that's the potential for, for a over-optimistic agent and seller to not see that the location is, is affecting the value of the property and then not pricing it right or hence overexposing it. And then the, the end result just happens to be now that you're getting it, your, your listing's going to expire because you overexpose the property. Right? So, so I, I actually just answered that question why would a home listing expire in a poor physical location? And mainly it's because of, of over optimistic sellers and agents not realizing that the property is not in a good location. They're kind of like putting the blinders on them. Like, oh, no, I, I don't care about any of this. I'm just going to price it the way everything else is priced. But what happens? The, the, sometimes the listings expire. If you can recognize these things, a lot of times you can, you can help explain this to a seller and get it priced right, right? It's about your research, your, your knowledge and determination on, on getting these listings. Any, any other questions or comments on that? So occupancy, whoa. The action or fact of occupying a place. There are different types of occupancy, right? There's tenancy, tenure, residence, residency, inhabitation, habitation, living, lease, holding, or possession. Uh, one I didn't use here is, uh, what's it called when they, uh, and they just kind of break in and, and, and uh, I, I don't know why I can't think of the term right now, but, but it, it's on the tip of my tongue. Um, they say that possession and nine tenths of the law, an, an uncooperative or difficult, difficult. Squatters. 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 You think, thank you, Larry. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking, right? They're squatting the, on the home and they're, they're now trespassing, but for the most part in the state of California, there's different rules and you should pay attention to those, right? So an uncooperative or difficult occupant can be a point of contention. Let's not forget any unwanted pests. So occupancy isn't just the people, but it could be pests like rats, possums, uh, cockroaches, right? There could be a lot of different things that occupy the property that could potentially uh, cause problems and cause a listing to expire. So occupancy also includes vacant homes. A vacant home can also be a, a hindrance on selling a property, right? So a lot of times what some, what some agents do or, or some sellers do is they stage a property. They, they put furniture in it, making it look occupied. Um, so why, why would a home listing expire if occupancy was an issue? So one of the things um, that we come across here in California, mainly in Los Angeles County and in the city of Los Angeles, um, city proper, is rent control. Okay, so this is a law that, that requires a landlord, if they're going to displace a, a, a family, that they have to pay them per person. And I don't remember exactly how much it is. I haven't experienced that in a while but I kind of remember it being like 5,000 per person or something like that, okay? It's, it's, it's a lot of money that somebody has to pay to pretty much displace family. The only other way to get them out is if they don't pay rent and you can't force somebody not to pay rent. So uh, as long as they're um, uh, coming through with their, with their contractual obligations, they have every right to stay on that property. Now, not all cities and areas or counties have those laws. So you just have to be 
uh, uh, mindful of what's going on in some of those areas, okay? But occupancy of a home could be the cause of an expired listing. So these are things that you can potentially uh, address prior to take, taking a listing or during the time you take the listing. But uh, you, remember, you're approaching somebody that already has been trying to deal with this entire situation. But uh, the idea here is just to be mindful of it. So any questions or comments on that before we move on to the next seg segment? Okay, so those are those are the reasons just off the top of my head. Uh, I've experienced many of those. Some of them is just more uh, just kind of uh, uh, pondering on the fact of, hey, why, why would a listing expire, right? Those are the things that I came up with. So um, there could be more uh, reasons. I'm sure there is more reasons why this thing would expire. But us as agents now, what we do is we want to target those same people because we know they want to sell, right? But they just didn't have the wherewithal to get it sold. It expired. So now it becomes our job to now uh, ponder on the reasons why something expired and figure out a solution. Because there has to be at some point a meeting of the minds in terms of what, the, what a buyer potentially wants and then obviously what the seller wants. And usually what, what, what we all hear and what we all know is the buyer wants a good deal and the seller wants more money. Yeah, yeah, of course, Larry, thank you for joining us um, uh, anytime. And just know that if you want more information on this, uh, the next segment is actually more of a how-to. You're welcome to see the recording, okay, so you know how to get on to that. But have a good evening, sir. I appreciate you coming on. So um, if, we, if we don't have any other questions or comments, uh, we can move on to the research and advertising of expired listings. You guys ready? Let me uh, wet my whistle here real quick. Okay, so if you guys open up your MLS, okay, when looking for expired listings, there are two locations that, that they can be found, the quick search and the real estate tax. Now, uh, this happens to be the, the, the SNP that you're seeing here of, of the interface of MLS, happens to be PWR, but I noticed that Downey and some of the other areas, uh, MLSs, their interface looks a little bit different, but it, but it says the same thing. So you'll see an area where it says search, and then you'll see an area where it either says realist tax or just realist, right? Realist is public record, okay? So this is where you would find, number one, any public record on a property, but what I'm gonna be showing you here is, I'm gonna be showing you using the MLS system, how to find expired listings, as well as using the realist system, which is public record, okay? And so moving on to the realist system, what you'll find is, this is a snip now of the left side of the page, because the right side of the page is a map, and then right underneath that would be the one lines of anything that you find. But this section that you see here that I just popped up will be on the left. And if you click on the My Search section, because the majority of time, you, you're gonna, when you go into the Realist, uh, when you click on Realist, it's gonna go in a quick search, okay? But you, if you click over here where the blue arrow is to My Search, then, then it's gonna give you options to do a search on, on the map. And that, that's what I'll show you on the next slide. So an opening real list, click on the My Search and Shape tool will now function. So now you're looking at more of the entire page. So now when you click on the My Search section, okay, what, what you're gonna do is you're gonna click on the little uh, pencil looking thing, okay? And then what happens is, this little uh, drop down comes down where it says radius tool, rectangular tool, and polygon tool. Okay. And um, I always use the radius tool. It seems to be the easiest one to use, but you can use any one that you like. Okay. 
Um, I think that most of you guys are familiar with these tools as we've used them with different things before. Uh, but again, we're in the tax system or the realist system, okay? And so what you would do is, or what I would do is I would click the, the radius tool and then I would simply pick an area. So you'll see here that I made a little circle around Whittier in that little area. Now, the system will tell you um, if your area is too big, it'll tell you that you can only go so far. So it'll ask you to shrink it down. And the reason why is because I think you can only display a thousand records, okay? Um, so it, it'll, it'll tell you, uh, that you that you went too big, okay? So now on that same menu at top, now you, so you'll see the pencil here, okay? But right to the right, you'll see the little search hourglass or the, the uh, magnifying glass. It gives you an option here and you, what you're gonna click on is expires, okay? So now I've got the, the radius circle area of Whittier that, I, that I'm, which just happens to be Uptown Whittier, okay. But when I click on expires, and, and you'll see there that it's telling me three months to the right, that means that it's giving me the expired listings in the past three months, okay. Uh, now, now what I'm going to do is, and let me just see where I, okay, so I, it, it moved a little quick there. But it went straight to, to printing labels, but you'll see that on this on the center uh, figure here. Once I have clicked expired, it, it gives me an option to, to search. OK, so when I do my search, you'll see here on the bottom that a bunch of properties popped up. Well, those are the expired listings. OK, so now you'll see at the bottom of, of the page with this blue arrow here. OK. I can print labels or maybe I just want to print it out, right? I don't have to print labels, but I can just, or, or I can just pr print a PDF of all the expired listings in the area that I just chose. So finally, once listings are located, you can make and print labels for mailers or, or farm planning. Okay. And that's how the labels look when they, when they come out. It's a popular format of label that sold, you know, at Staples or, or Sam's Club, Costco. Uh, you can probably buy, I think I bought a box of 6,000 labels for like 35 bucks, something like that. But you can see as fast as I just showed you how to do this, that's how fast you can literally print labels to do your expired listing marketing. So, um, I, I hope I didn't go too fast because we're about to do the same thing with MLS, okay? Um, is, is there any questions so far on this? I'll, I'll recap on it real quick. <laughs> okay, say that's enjoying this. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll recap real fast. I, I think you guys can see my mouse on the screen. Um, so we go to the little pencil, right? It's going to give us the option to use a radius tool. I go and I use my radius tool in the area, right? And then I'm going to go now to my, my uh, magnifying glass or the search uh, icon, right? It's going to give me this drop down and I'm going to go to expired listings. I'm going to keep it on three months. Once I click enter, the properties show up here at the bottom. If I click labels now, I can pick and choose too. You, you can't really see it because it's off to the left, but it gives you options to pick and choose what you want, right? And you can pick and choose what you want, go to labels, and then it'll print labels just like what you see there on the right. So um, that was a recap of, of what we just talked about. Now, uh, what I suggest you guys do is just kind of fiddle around with this a little bit. You may not want to use it right away, but it's there. And this is a way that you can actually research your area and do some marketing. And um, I'll even tell you what I do. I'll give you a little nugget, okay? I print these labels out, okay? And I, what I do is I get uh, the mailers that I use, they look like invitations, okay? And most of the time they're, they're colored envelopes. 
So when when anybody when anytime you get something in the mail, you know, you can kind of tell that it's um, an advertisement. But if you get something that looks like an invitation, you're going to open it, right? Because, you know, you're thinking it's from a family member or whatever, okay? So actually what I've done is I, I got a stamp made. You know, here's my stamp, right, that I made um, for my return address. So, you know, I'm, I'm stamping all my envelopes with the return address. I'm actually sticking the labels on the envelopes. And believe it or not, it, it's, it's very tedious. But, um, you know, I can get 100 of these out probably every day. Um, may take me a couple hours, but hey, if you're going to spend a couple hours and, and try to reach 100 people, that's not bad, right? So that said, um, that's how you find expired listings on your real list system, which everyone has on MLS. If you go to your MLS, you go to that uh, real list section. Um, that's also how you find property. If you, if you go off to the right, I'm sorry, to the left, you can put a property address in and just find one piece of property. Uh, that's how you find uh, the seller's name or you just want more information on a, on, a, on a piece of property that's public record. It's all there, okay? Any, any other questions or comments? All right, so let's keep moving here. So now we're gonna, we're gonna do the same thing on MLS, okay? So when you go to uh, MLS, and you go to search, okay? Um, you're gonna use the quick search where, where you should always be using the quick search, okay? And then on the left there, you're gonna see status, you're gonna click on expired, right? And then, and this is, this is a little trick that not too many people know, and I'll be honest with you, uh, the, whoever designed this did it poorly because I didn't even know it was there for years before I actually found out that it was there. Okay, but you'll see under map search, you'll see this little line where that, that blue arrow is. If you put your address in there, you're, you're, the, of the area that you're looking at, okay, it, it, what it'll do is it'll give you a one, a one mile radius search of the address that you pop in there. And why it's just that little spot, I'll never know, but but there it is. And then if you want to make it two miles, three miles, you can change it there to the left. You see it says within one mile of, and then that location, okay? So now what you've done is you, you're, you're, you're telling the system you want expired listings of between now and 180 days. And obviously you can change that if you want. So that's six months, right? Let's say you just want the last three months a one mile radius of, of, a, of an area that you're looking at, or you just find a property that, that you, you can kind of target and pinpoint, okay? And then what it does is it, it gives you those expired listings. Let me back up there real quick, okay? So when using MLS looking for expired listings, it's simple. Click on expired listings, choose your area, and this will display on the map. Now, you can't uh, print labels, or, or actually you might be able to now with the new system. Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't bothered to look because I don't really use this for that necessarily, but this is just another way to find expired listings in your area. Now, the big question becomes, hey, Alex, you know, how do we get these, these sellers phone numbers? Okay, well, unfortunately that's not public record. A lot of the people in the world are on do not call lists. So that's not something you're going to find right away. Most listing agents are savvy enough not to put their agent or I'm sorry, their client's phone number on the listing. Sometimes you'll find that they will because maybe they're new agents and they just don't know any better. But the majority of time, you're going to find that the, that the phone number is not there. Okay. So uh, that, that's usually a question that I get on, on this segment of the class. Okay. Okay. Uh, but that's how you find expired listings in an area on MLS. So any questions or comments on that? All right, so actually we're at, we're at the, uh, the end of the presentation. So let's do final thoughts, okay? 
So listings expire frequently on MLS for different reasons. The main reason is overexposure. Sellers think that agents have some magic dust. They overprice their homes thinking the agent will sprinkle their magic and sell their home for over market value. The truth is the agent can only do what they can. If it fails, the listing expires. Agents can find these listings on MLS daily. Best thing to do is to approach the homeowner at home, get in a conversation as to what the problem was and try and find solutions. Have your listing presentation, i.e. comps, other listings and supporting documents with you to hand to them. Frequent visits in following days and weeks are necessary to get yourself known. Offer explanations for different marketing tactics. Lastly, close the show. Okay, so um, with this presentation, what I wanted to show you is some of the reasons of why listings expire. So whereas, as I mentioned before, you kind of putting a mirror up to you and saying, hey, you know what, this could be the reason why my, my listings are expiring, right? But you can take advantage of other folks um, or agents uh, over optimism, if you will, okay? Because now you can target these same properties and potentially get some listings of your own. So just know that part of your portfolio should be expired listings, not just door knocking or not just uh, probates or not just uh, uh, short sales. You know, you might have some expired listings un under your belt. Um, now increasing your portfolio on some of the other things that we've talked about. But uh, you can find them fairly easily. I, I showed you how to do that. Now that this is recorded, you can you be able to reference it again and again if you need to. Um, I'm always a phone call away if you guys uh, want to talk about it. Uh, so that said, any questions or comments thus far? All right. All right. So let's keep moving here. Um, we're on slide uh, 19 and coming up on just uh, some of the filler stuff. Um, as mentioned before, I am recording these sessions. So uh, the YouTube channel is up. They're also being synced on Rumble. Um, if you're more of a Rumble fan than YouTube. Uh, so if you're interested in viewing any previous recordings, this is the link, okay? Just know that, um, obviously you can't click on this screen, but just know that uh, uh, the link comes over on the email that I send you. Um, at the very bottom, the link is there and feel free to share it with anybody. Uh, this is uh, free information. And like I said, I like to share this information to, to make for a stronger real estate industry, make for uh, a positive real estate industry to the consumer. So feel free to share that link, okay guys? And feel free to take a look. And I mean, I think now there's over 30 uh, presentations on there. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm, my hopes are to get to like maybe 52, maybe 55. So my hope, my hopes are that um, uh, these become a little bit more popular, and uh, there's a lot more how-to like this one uh, in terms of getting information and and actually being able to do some viable marketing. So um, so this is all just part of that. So I appreciate you guys' support on that. And then obviously, if you're going to go on to the YouTube uh, sessions, if you would be so kind to please subscribe. So we're, whereas we can get credit for your views, okay? So, um, well, you're welcome, uh, Selling Robert, anytime, guys. You, you know, you guys are regulars and I uh, always enjoy having you guys come on and ask good questions. So um, with that said, Larry had to take off. I guess he had another uh, appointment, but there's his information. Um, if you should have any title questions, um, Liz can answer any of your uh, loan questions and or pre-approvals and or if you have a client that needs a loan, you, you know, she'd be more than happy to help on that end. Uh, I always endorse Mr. David Plummer's product. Uh, uh, incredible uh, real estate trainer and individual. The, the man just has a huge heart. And, uh, you know, it just shows when you listen to him, it, it actually motivates you, uh, not on just what he says, but how he says it. 
And so I um, highly recommend you, you attend some of his classes uh, if possible. And then Shamim, she's with Property ID. If you guys are, uh, have any questions or anything on Property ID or NHD reports, um, feel free to give her a call. She's uh, just a phone call away. So thank you guys for coming. Um, this is the end of marketing and expired listings. And I'm hoping that you guys were able to take some nuggets away from today in terms of how to get business with expired listings. Uh, I have actually gotten much business from mailers that I mentioned to you with making those expired listing labels. And then, you know, I, I put a nice little something in the, in the envelope for them to read. Okay. And, um, it's marketing stuff. You know, you guys can come up with, with all kinds of different ideas on what you would tell uh, or what you would say to a potential seller of an expired listing to try and get their business. You just have to be cre creative. Like I said, be, in, be an individual, be yourself. Very important because if you try to be somebody else, people can, can sense that. And uh, it's actually a sign of weakness. So be yourself. It's more of a sign of strength. And, and I, I say that uh, with a grain of salt, you know, everybody's got their own style. Everybody's got their own way of doing things. I certainly don't want to impede that. I don't want you guys to be a bunch of Alex's out there doing, doing real estate. No, I want you guys to be individuals and I want you guys to be doing your own thing. It's what makes life fun. Okay. So uh, here's some examples of, of something that you guys can do to market yourselves. So if you guys get excited with that, it's something that we all pay for and is there for our use. And uh, uh, I just wanted to expose that to you guys. Okay. So if if there's no other questions or comments, um, you guys want to uh, un unmute and uh, anybody have any issues that they want to talk about or. Um, okay. So so Gus, you're asking me for a copy of a postcard. Now, now, when I mention what I do is um, I use envelopes, okay? I, I don't use postcards. I, I use envelopes that look like invitations, okay? And then I have different things that I send uh, different people that I've built over the years. Um, so I, I could probably send out some examples. I, have, I just have to look. Uh, Gus, I'm assuming that you get uh, my emails that I send out for the for the uh, for the for the presentation. Did you get my email today for the presentation? If if you did, I'll I'll just send it out to everybody, and then uh, that way they can have some examples of some of the things that I send sellers um, because I have different ones. You know, I have ones for short sales. I have one for for expired listings. Um, and I'm, I'm a little creative with things. So please use my as an example and then and then make your own, right? It doesn't take too, too much time, but at, for the most part, if if you do get some business from it, you have it's a little more prideful. You know, you're a little more prideful of, of what you got because it was yours. It was something that you did. Um, but yeah, I, I, I will share it with you guys um, in terms of the, the expired listing stuff in reference to what we talked about today. Anyway, good to see you again, guys. Uh, hope things are well. And uh, uh, I hope that this kind of inspired you guys to think of some ideas on, you know, how to get listings. Now, I know we talked about expired listings here, but remember that the system has all of the addresses in it. So if you pull a small little area, and just want labels for the area, you can pull just that. It doesn't have to be expired listings, right? It could be anything. And you can market to anything, right? Um, there's something called EDDM. It's Every Door Direct Marketing, which would require a, a postcard. But with the EDDM, you don't even need labels. And each marketing piece Instead of 50 cents for a stamp that we have to pay if we're gonna if we're gonna send out mailers, if you use EDDM, the postage is, is more like 15 cents because the 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 
The mail carrier is simply just dropping it off to every door that he stops at. So that's something else that you guys can consider in your marketing that would be a lot more effective than mailers. This, this expired listing um, concept is more targeted. This is a targeted marketing technique, right? As opposed to EDDM is what we call blanket marketing, okay? So just something to think about on that end. But for the most part, um, these are these are all things that can keep us busy. If we if we do this, uh, let's say a part of our of our month, we spend some time doing some mailers on expired listings, and then we go back to maybe some of the other things that are that are being effective. Right? We're picking up more listings. We're picking up more buyers. That's the idea. It'll keep you guys busy. It'll keep you guys uh, energized. And, and, and the, remember, the consistency is the key. You just got to keep doing it. You may not get any responses right away, but just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, because that ultimately is what, what creates results. So that said, um, if there's anything else, uh, I'm going to sign off. Um, unless, unless anybody else got any other questions or anybody have any other anything else that uh, you guys want to talk about, you're welcome, Celia. Gus, you're welcome, sir. Um, okay, well, you guys have a good night. I'm glad you guys were able to make it tonight. And um, again, um, the link to the YouTube channel is at the bottom of the emails that I send out. So feel free to, uh, to share that link as well as use it and subscribe um, to the channel if you, if you would please. Uh, whereas we can get a little bit more credit for our efforts and also share the good information. Okay, so with that, guys, um, I'll see you guys next week. Um, I'm probably going to do uh, the NAR uh, announcements next week. That has to do with new policies, some of them which we, which we see on the new listing agreement, the clear cooperation policies, and some of the other policies that, that have affected us recently, and also um, have, kind of goes along with agent behavior. So uh, we can, can kind of combat that on, on, on one end um, and hopefully not act that way. Okay, so um, that's the one I'm considering doing next week, but I'm not sure. So anyway, that's it, guys. You guys have a good evening. I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you guys for, uh, for joining me.